which is about 36 out of 49. Uh, first thing we'll do is give you the uh, question that we'll have on the exam for the exclusive economic zone. And the question is going to be, compare and contrast the rights and freedoms of other states in the EEZ and the rights and jurisdiction of the coastal states in the EEZ. And we'll talk about the details of what that means. So the exclusive economic zone, I'll, I'll talk about that. <laughs> We're going to spend a whole hour. All right, so the exclusive economic zone began with the Santiago Declaration of Chile, Ecuador, and Peru in 1952. And these three states made a unilateral, or I guess trilateral declaration that they would assert sovereignty and jurisdiction over the, the area adjacent to their shore going out to 200 nautical miles. And they did so principally on the basis of ensuring subsistence and development as developing states. And what they wanted to do is that they wanted to internalize, in economic terms, they wanted to internalize the benefits or the, the value offshore and in doing so, they uh, they wanted to preclude other states from accessing this area. Of course, other states, especially the United States and Japan, did not accept the unilateral declaration. And the debate continued all the way through until the creation of the exclusive economic zone in the, uh, in the late 1970s and, and was validated in 1982. But this is the origin of the exclusive economic zone. And so these, these states were sort of at the forefront of creating this zone of national resource jurisdiction. Because at the time, only the major maritime powers, which were the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, the United States, France, and Great Britain, uh, and Japan, only these, uh, only these five states, I mentioned the US twice, there's only five states, Japan, UK, France, Soviet Union, and the United States had access to these offshore areas. And as a result, the, the developing countries thought that it was not, uh, certainly not fair, and also was not conducive to their development to allow their offshore resources to be exploited by other countries. So they sought to internalize these resources. The idea of the EEZ, which was before it was called the EEZ, is also reflected in Article 6 of the Convention on Fishing, which states in 1958 that coastal states had a special interest in this area offshore. But it didn't really validate, it didn't really specify what that special interest was, what it looked like, what it was composed of. And it also didn't say how far offshore, because at this time, Many states were just saying, well, if we could just have a 12-mile territorial sea, that would be our fishing zone. Further on, the idea, in, it was really in the 1970s, including a number of states that began to assert a, an exclusive fishing zone or an exclusive economic zone. And all coastal states are also maritime states, including the United States. The United States unilaterally declared what is tantamount to an exclusive economic zone in 1976 to take effect in 1977. So the United States is a maritime power, but it also has the world's largest exclusive economic zone. And there are interests within the United States, based on fisheries and environmental protection, that act very much like a coastal state and not as a maritime power. So within the government, there's different views uh, within the U.S. and with other countries. States are not unitary actors, but they have pluralistic, competing ideas within the governments, oftentimes. And the same was true in the United States. So, many of you may know Ambassador Hostum Jadal from Indonesia, and he really captured this idea of agency or coastal proximity in which the coastal state has a superior right to the areas offshore. It wasn't just the developing states, though, Iceland. Which, which has a large percentage of its economy dedicated to fishing, began to push uh, a broader 
uh, type of fishing zone. It wasn't called an EEZ back then, but it was a fishing zone. And this caused great uh, disagreement between Iceland and some European countries, in particular the United Kingdom and Germany. You're going to get all these slides, by the way, it's PDFs. You're going to have everything. So you're welcome to take pictures, but um, or, or write it down. But you're going to have all this text. So Iceland declared in 1952 a four nautical mile uh, territorial sea, and then in 1958 a 12 nautical mile territorial sea, in 1971 50 nautical miles, and this created what is referred to as the cod war, COD. After the fish, the cod, it, this, this is a very rich cod fishery in this area. And there were, this almost split the North Atlantic Treaty Organization because West Germany and the United Kingdom and Iceland were all part of NATO and yet they had a serious disagreement on the water. They would interdict each other's ships, they would try to board each other's ships, uh, they would ram into each other's ships. Very much some of the type of conduct that you see now in the South China Sea over disagreement with Iceland unilaterally expanding its, its uh, fishing zone. Why is it so important? Why do we care about the EEZ? As I've said many times, including in my dissertation, the EEZ, or this area offshore, is the most important area of the oceans. It's the most important. Why is that? Well, the principal reason for, if, you, if you're a civilian, if you care about fisheries, if you care about uh, the marine environment, is because 90% of the biomass are contained, of the oceans are contained in these large marine ecosystems that cling to the shore. This is the most productive trophic area in the world. This is where 90% of the ocean's biomass is, including, of course, 90% of the fish. It's also where 80% of the oil and gas reserves, it's where most of the shipping routes are, and it's where a lot of the marine scientific research is conducted. So if you think about shipping routes, there is, of course, globalization and there's transcontinental shipping. You have shipping from LA Long Beach to, to China and to Asia. But most shipping is called cabotage shipping, C-A-B-O-T-H-A-G, cabotage. And it's up and down the coast. Most shipping is within this 200 nautical mile zone. So this is the busiest zone. It's the zone of oil and gas exploration. It's the zone of, of recreation and leisure. And that's why when you have more users coming into contact with them, one another, you have a greater uh, likelihood of, of uh, disagreement or conflict. But really, the expansion of the, of the, of the, of the zone, or the creation of the EEZ, was all about developing states and their revolution of rising expectations in the 1950s, 60s, and then early 70s in claiming sort of their, their right or their legacy for development. This is a, a, a fishery uh, market in Somalia. The EEZs are also the most important from a strategic aspect. So if you are concerned, like I came from the, the U.S. Naval War College, and concerned about political military affairs in the oceans, the EEZs are the most important because these are the areas that the, the naval forces operate. A navy, a high seas fleet, has some missions sort of in the, in the middle of the ocean. But mostly it's a transit zone, both for commercial ships as well as for naval vessels. So if you think about it, these are the areas that the U.S. Marine Corps, which is the expeditionary force for the U.S. Navy, considers sort of the hot spots or the most likely areas of conflict in the world. And all of these overlap with the exclusive economic zones. These are the areas where naval forces come into contact with each other and are most likely to, uh, to, to lead to some sort of incident, uh, greater tension, and possibly even war. These are also the areas where naval forces project power ashore. So naval forces have a utility of changing, uh, of changing the political military landscape. The oceans are the world's largest domain of maneuver. And a lot of military affairs is about outmaneuvering your opponent. And if you have military forces, air and sea forces such as Marines, and you can take them and, and move them around, you can outflank 
your opponent, and you can insert uh, you can insert mass power in a concentrated area at a place that you're choosing. And so that's why the oceans are much more important than on land, because on land it takes a long time to move military forces, but at sea it's a very flexible instrument. This is really why first the, the, the Spanish and the Portuguese and, the, and then the Dutch, and then especially the British, were able to rule the world with such small populations, because they could bring a preponderance of force to bear in one location at the point of their choosing, and, and that's not something that land armies such as Russia, for example, uh, have been able to do. So what we're going to talk about is the exclusive economic zone, with that as the backdrop. Of course, this is the 200-mile zone is measured from the baseline, and the important thing to remember is that it is a special zone, that it is not either territorial sea or high seas. In Latin, it's called sui generis. It is a special zone with a special regime that applies. <laughs> what is a regime? It's a rule set around which expectations converge. That's right. And it's important to remember, it's often forgotten, but I want you to remember that the EEZ was cut out of or created from the high seas. So there's a lot of people, a lot of misunderstanding that the EEZ is sort of a, a, a zone of national uh, aggrandizement or national territory and that the coastal state can confer rights on the international community or can allow the users of the international community to do certain things in their EEZ. But it's actually just the opposite. The EEZ was, uh, was the global commons or raised communities. It was owned by all states. And all states decided that the coastal state would be afforded some specific, some special specific provisions that gave it preferential access, sovereign rights and jurisdiction, but not sovereignty. So the balance of interests uh, inert or, or flow to the international community. In other words, if you have to look at a balance of interest between the coastal state and the international community in the EEZ, I would suggest, not everyone would agree, but I think uh, most international lawyers would agree, that the balance of interest is really in favor of the international community, even though it's considered a coastal state's uh, EEZ. We'll talk about uh, exactly why. Article 55. So we're going through Part 5. We've already talked about Part 2. Now we'll master Part 5, the Territorial Sea and the EEZ. These are two of the most important parts of the Law of Sea Convention of the 17 parts. Which has greater rights? The coastal state has rights and jurisdiction in the EEZ. Everybody else has rights and freedoms in the EEZ. Which has the greater rights? They both have rights. One has rights and the other has rights. So they cancel each other out. They both have rights. One has jurisdiction and one has freedoms. Which is greater? Freedoms is considered a higher uh, species or a higher genus of rights. And therefore, that's why I would suggest that, uh, that, the, that the coastal states have limited rights and all the other rights flow to the international community. So what are the rights of coastal states? They're fairly specified and they are centered on three things. So. To answer your question, one of you two asked me to restate the question. Uh, the question is going to be something along the lines of compare and contrast the rights and jurisdiction of the coastal state in the EEZ with the rights and freedoms of other states in the EEZ. Now we're talking about the first part of that, the rights and jurisdiction of the coastal state. There are principally three. First is exclusive and sovereign rights to the living and non-living resources of the water column, of the seabed and subsoil, and of the surface of the water. The living and non-living resources are the are the, the really the principal benefit or the principal rights. And also the motor vessel Virginia G case, and it was case of 2014, said that those sovereign rights also include 
additional or tertiary rights related to those related to the core rights. So in this case, um, this case was about uh, bunkering, providing bunker fuel for fishing vessels in the exclusive economic zone, and uh, and so the, there was a ship that was providing uh, bunker fuel to fishing vessels, and it was boarded by coastal state authorities. And the coastal state said, "Hey, you cannot do this because you don't have permission in our exclusive economic zone." And the vessel said, "Wait a minute, I'm not fishing." I'm not affecting your living or non-living resources. All I'm doing is selling fuel to other fishing vessels. And that's, that's up to you and them as to whether that's lawful or not. All I'm doing is providing a service, and it doesn't include uh, infringing upon your resource rights. But it was disagreed. I probably would not have decided the case this way, but I don't, I don't think it's a ridiculous decision. I think it's a, a, a valid rationale. And what they said was, well, wait a minute. You're providing a service that really is affecting these core rights. And therefore, we're going to allow the coastal state to, to regulate that activity, to regulate bunker fuel, because it's associated with this, these rights of living and non-living resources. So the coastal state has those rights, as well as jurisdiction over artificial islands, installations, and structures, marine scientific research, and protection of the marine environment. Now, look at this. It has sovereign rights of living and non-living resources, but it only has a jurisdiction over marine scientific research, protection of the marine environment, and artificial islands. What's the difference between a right and a jurisdiction? We've already, we already know that a freedom is greater than jurisdiction, and I would suggest that a right is a greater species of, uh, of, of ownership than jurisdiction as well. So jurisdiction is not insignificant, but it is, um, it is less than a freedom or a right. In other words, the authority of the coastal state for marine scientific research, for uh, artificial islands and installations, and protection of the marine environment is much more circumscribed, meaning it's, um, it's much more sort of carefully bounded or carefully uh, limited. Marine scientific research. This was an area that was of uh, a, a great debate, like most things in the law of the sea uh, process at home close three. And the United States and some other countries, uh, the major maritime powers, promoted an idea of freedom of marine scientific research in the exclusive economic zone. A lot of the developing states, the Group of 77, the non line movement, were uh, much less accepting of that. Um, and they prevailed on the issue. So the, the rule was a compromise, but it, but it gravitated more toward a restrictive uh, regime. What it says is that the coastal state consent is required for marine scientific research in the EEZ, but that coastal state consent is mandatory or shall be forthcoming if the request is to conduct pure scientific research. So in other words, coastal state percent consent is required, but on the other hand, the coastal state shall produce, provide that consent. If the research is resource related, then the coastal state has much greater discretion. So theoretically, the coastal state has no discretion if it's pure scientific research. In practice, however, uh, that's not the case. In practice, coastal states um, uh, have wide discretion and sometimes do not approve of even pure research. For a variety of reasons. We could, we could, uh, we could talk about it. One of the reasons is suspicion that pure research is, uh, is a cover for some sort of intelligence activities. Another reason is that Governments just don't know how to respond. They have agencies that are competing with each other. They're not sure which agency has the uh, authority to approve or deny a request, so they just ignore it because governments are dysfunctional. The U.S. government is dysfunctional, and probably all of your governments are, are dysfunctional. 
And so uh, <laughs> things happen that way. So there are, you know, there are some better governments. I mean, I, Singapore comes to mind, uh, maybe Canada, but a lot of countries, even Canada, a lot of countries uh, have governments that just don't operate very well. They don't operate as a as a as a, as a coherent decision maker. What about environmental enforcement? You have to go to part 12 on marine environment, and so we'll just take a quick, brief detour to part 12, and you can go to Article 220. Article 220 doesn't give the coastal state plenary authority or absolute authority over marine environmental protection in the EZ. What it says is that there's very limited coastal state authority for enforcement in the EZ, and the coastal state can require information, can require information from a vessel if it has clear grounds of a violation of internationally accepted standards. These are standards which are generally adopted by the International Maritime Organization. If it has clear grounds of a substantial discharge, then the coastal state can conduct a physical inspection of the ship throughout the entire EZ. But it has to have clear grounds of a substantial discharge. Well, what are clear grounds? It's, it's, you know, this is a legal standard, more likely than not, or beyond a reasonable doubt. Nobody really knows. It's, uh, it, it's more than, more than uh, a 50 percent, um, but it's less than 100 percent assurity. 100 percent. Uh, so, what does it mean? for a substantial discharge. What's the difference between a, an in, insubstantial discharge and a substantial discharge? That's also a line drawing exercise. Like most of the things in the law, it requires lawyers to draw a line. And I can't tell you whether uh, probably a million barrels of oil is a substantial discharge. Uh, is one barrel of oil a substantial discharge? I would probably say not, but reasonable people might might differ. Uh, and so nobody knows exactly where this line is drawn between what's a substantial discharge and what is a sort of an insignificant discharge. Then the coastal state can, uh, if it has clear objective evidence of a discharge causing major damage, uh, it can take additional steps, including bringing the vessel sometimes into port. So it can establish uh, higher enforcement over over the ship. These provisions are rarely exercised in the EZ, but I would suspect that they are going to be more and more enforcement along these lines. Coastal states have the, the, the aforementioned rights in the EZ, and we'll we'll return to those rights, especially with the living and non-living resources. But going in order of the articles in, the, in, in Part 5, we'll talk about coastal state duties next. So just to recap, though, coastal state rights are, uh, are enumerated. Living and non-living resources is the principal right, the, the right of, uh, over uh, sovereign rights over living and non-living resources, and then jurisdiction over artificial islands, installations, and structures jurisdiction over marine scientific research, and some limited jurisdiction and enforcement for marine environmental protection. What about other states? Other states uh, uh, are the beneficiary of, of duties owed by the coastal state. In other words, the coastal state has rights in the EZ, but it also owes duties to other states. It has obligations to other states. The coastal state has to have, quote, due regard for the rights and duties of other states. We'll, we'll revisit that, but I'm going to go in order of the articles. Article 57 is very simple, that the EEZ is a 200 nautical mile zone. 200 nautical miles from the baselines. Other states have rights and duties. First of all, they have the right of freedom of navigation and overflight, laying of submarine cables and pipelines, and then the right to do other internationally lawful uses of the sea related to those freedoms. These rights are set forth in Article 58, Paragraph 2, and they are importing from the high seas 
the rights that are specified in Article 87. So Article 58, Paragraph 2, takes all of the high seas freedoms that are in Article 87 and it imports them into the EEZ. For the most part. For the most part. So what it says is that these rights in the high seas apply in the EEZ to the extent that they make sense, to the extent that they're not inconsistent with the EEZ. So the right of fishing is a high seas right, but it is not imported into the EEZ because that wouldn't make sense. That infringes on the coastal states' rights. What are other internationally lawful uses of the sea? We understand freedom of navigation, freedom of overflight. The United States, for example, is in uh, sort of an ongoing disagreement with China in particular over freedom of navigation. Freedom of navigation, for example, in the South China Sea. And the United States would send a warship and China would object. And this is, you know, this happened for the last 20 years or so on occasion. And China says, look, you're entitled to freedom of navigation, but you're not entitled to collect intelligence. You can have sort of a simple transit. So the view is that freedom of navigation is somewhat, in that view, is somewhat akin to like innocent passage. That you're entitled just to navigate, but you can't do other things. I would suggest that that's not a, a historical or a legal reading uh, of, the, of the convention. Because it's not just freedom of navigation and overflight, but it's other internationally lawful uses of the sea. And those other traditional uses of the sea include this whole list. I'm not going to read them. You're going to get the, the brief anyway. But it's all these other things that, that states have done. Military exercises, maneuvers, intelligence collection, recovery of spacecraft, uh, reconnaissance, uh, verification for arms control treaties, uh, ballistic missile defense. Uh, we have uh, the United States and Japan and Korea operate vessels at sea that are, uh, that are on patrol to be ready for North Korean ballistic missiles. That's considered a high seas freedom. We do it in other countries, exclusive economic zone all the time. All of these things occur in the Mediterranean Sea, which is almost entirely exclusive economic zone. These occur in the Baltic Sea. So I would suggest that really, it's, uh, if, you, if you look at the history and you look at state practice, all of these other international lawful uses of the sea are part of this package in Article 87 that, are, that is imported into the exclusive economic zone. Now, the convention in Article 58 also says, in addition to those that we just talked about in Article 87, there's a long list of additional high seas rights from Article 88 to 115 that may be conducted in the exclusive economic zone. So this is interesting because it's essentially all of these rights from 88 to, 150, to Articles 115 that are included here. And what do they? What does that encompass? Well, all these other high seas freedoms that are not related to those those three major specified rights of the coastal state. All of these other high seas freedoms. The first is that the high seas are reserved for peaceful purposes. So some states have claimed and. China in the past has claimed, look, you can't conduct a military exercise in the EEZ of a coastal state because that's not a peaceful purpose. I would suggest that that's a very poor lawyering, and very poor reading of the convention because the high seas are reserved for peaceful purposes. So you can do anything uh, on the high seas that you, uh, you can do in the EEZ. Peaceful purposes is defined by the UN Charter. Remember we talked about yesterday. If something is a peaceful purpose, it is consistent with Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the Charter of the United Nations. What is not allowed is the threat or use of force. So if there's a military exercise that is threatening a coastal state in some sort of overt way, then I would agree that that is a violation of peaceful purposes. If it's an aggressive uh, military exercise, such as, like, what's, what's an example of that? Uh, such as China, for example, launching uh, missiles into the Taiwan Strait back in 1996 to try to intimidate Taiwan in its re-election. I would agree. Um, that sort of gunboat diplomacy is not a peaceful purpose. It's a, it's a threat of the use of force in violation of the UN Charter. Well, what about if you have an aircraft carrier battle group that is operating 50 miles off the coast of Hainan Island? 
Is that a, a peaceful purpose? Well, I would suggest it is, but perhaps reasonable people then could differ, depending on what they're doing. Are they shooting a lot of missiles? Are they uh, simulating attacks against targets in China? Now I'm starting to get less comfortable with it. But where you draw that line is something that lawyers would have to uh, debate. There's no, there's no single rule that I can tell you this is always going to be the case. You have to look at it uh, in, based on fact specifics and argue whether, it's, uh, whether it violates the UN Charter. The right of navigation is, uh, is also important again. Uh, the, the status of ships under Article 92 includes this idea of exclusive flag state jurisdiction. So this is important because in the EEZ, what this means is that if there is a violation of an of a international law, such as the Marine Pollution Convention, in the EEZ of a coastal state, the principal means of enforcement is exclusive flag state jurisdiction. It's not the coastal state. So let me repeat that. That if there, if vessels, uh, if vessels do something contrary to international law in the EZ, the principal means of enforcement is exclusive flag state jurisdiction. This could also apply for, for labor laws, uh, not just environmental laws, for safety violations. The principal means of enforcement would be the flag state. Why is that true? Because we don't want coastal states to feel free to board the vessels of other countries in 36 or 38 percent of the world's oceans. You can imagine the conflict that would result from that. Let's uh, go ahead. Yeah, please. I have uh, a question. Take, for instance, a habitat in one country has conflict with another. Then I am going to the E zone of that country I have conflict with, displaying my military equipment, yeah. form of an exercise yeah. peacefully. What is the peaceful process? So, so again, the analysis is under Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the UN Charter. What Article 2, Paragraph 4 says is that states may not commit armed aggression or the threat of armed aggression or use of force against other states. Where you draw the line between simply exercising your rights, practicing your military, conducting military exercises, and then on the one hand, or committing armed uh, threat of use of force on the other, is very fact dependent. It's case by case, okay? So exclusive flag state jurisdiction is the principal means of enforcement in the EEZ for any sort of violation. Warships also have immunity in the EEZ. They have sovereign immunity. So even if they commit a violation, the coastal state does not have any sort of lawful basis for enforcing jurisdiction against them. But can I say something? Does yeah. that work? I mean, normally, if it's... Well, let's, we can talk about that later. So, I mean, well, I don't want to get into sort of kind of a theoretical discussion on whether international law is effective or not. No, okay, but I, I think sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Yes, I think it generally works most of the time. It doesn't work all the time. It's just like the speed limit. Does it help? Sure. Does everybody obey it? No. All right. At least it's not. All right. Um, okay. So uh, continuing on with uh, with Article 88 and 115, Article 99 and Articles 100 through 108 talk about the right of warships and other government ships, such as Coast Guard vessels to be able to interdict vessels that they reasonably suspect of slave trafficking or conducting piracy or committing unauthorized broadcasting. What this means, this is very interesting, what this means is that, that warships of a foreign state have the exact same right to conduct counter-piracy operations 13 nautical miles off the coast of a coastal state. War, uh, did I say that part of it? Warships of other states have just the same rights to conduct counter piracy operations of a coastal state as does the coastal state. Let's give an example. If you have, let's take, who wants to be the victim state in my example? Which country? Let's say Honduras. Mm -hmm. All right? If, if uh, Japan is conducting counter piracy operations 13 nautical miles off Honduras, 
it has the exact same rights to do so as the Honduran Coast Guard. The Honduran Coast Guard doesn't have any additional rights than any other country 13 miles off its coast when it comes to counter piracy. Now, of course, the Honduran Coast Guard has these other rights of fisheries enforcement and marine scientific research enforcement and that sort of thing. But if you're just talking about interdiction of slave trafficking or counter piracy, the rights are exactly the same. The rights are exactly the same. I'm sorry? All right? So the right of visit, the right of approach and visit is in Article 110 of the Law of the Sea Convention. And what it says is that warships and Coast Guard vessels of all countries have the right of approach of any ship that they reasonably suspect of committing one of these uh, five offenses. And that if they have a reasonable suspicion, they can actually board the vessel and inspect the documents. And if they inspect the documents and that leads to further suspicion, they can even, uh, they can even examine the, the rest of the ship. They can, they can uh, search the rest of the ship. So these are the basis for right of approach and visit. Right of approach means that warships can approach another vessel and ask anything they want. A U.S. warship can approach a Dow in the Indian Ocean and it can ask, where are you going? What's the name of your ship? What flag registry do you have? Where have you come from? What was your last port? What's your next port? What are you carrying on board? How many crew members do you have? Do you have any weapons on board? Do you have any crew members from Afghanistan? Do you have any crew members that, uh, that are connected to extremist groups like ISIL or Al-Qaeda? Um, uh, what, what is the value of the cargo? Do you have any cash on board? Do you have euros? Do you have, uh, do you have yeah, Indian currency? Do you, uh, are you going to, have you been to Dubai? They can ask anything they want. This is called the right of approach. Now, what is the obligation of the Dow to answer those questions? What's the obligation? There is no obligation. There is no obligation. The Dow doesn't have to respond at all. There's nothing in international law that requires the Dow to respond to a U.S. warship or a Chinese warship, even though every day, in fact, right now, it's going on. There are warships of other countries asking commercial vessels all of these questions. Now, criminals uh, around the world are sometimes not an entirely smart group, and they answer the questions, and, those, and the answers may lead to reasonable suspicion. And once the warship has reasonable suspicion, then it has a right to board, regardless of whether it's given consent. So if I'm on the Dow, and I'm answering the question, and I say, what was your, what's your flag? Uh, my Indian flag. Okay, very good. Uh, we're confirming your registry. No, wait, I've changed my mind. I'm really a Pakistani flag. Oh, okay, now I'm even more interested in you. Uh, what are you carrying on board? We only have three people. Yeah, but it looks like you have six, from what I can see with binoculars. Oh, yeah, we really have six. No, wait, I've seen two more. Okay, yeah, we really have eight. So all of these things start to form reasonable suspicion, and the warship could then uh, board the vessel. It has to be reasonable suspicion of committing one of these one of these, though. The fact that, they're, that they might be terrorists is not on this list. So they have to be, in order to exercise this right of visit, it has to be one of these. Now, you can also exercise the right of visit by consent. You can just ask them, hey, can we come on board? 98% of all merchant ships of any flag, you know, with, with very few exceptions, maybe North Korea might be an exception, almost everybody will say, sure, you can come on board. Because the, war, the foreign warships at sea are not considered an adversary by merchant mariners. They welcome the warships out there because they view them as, as conducting a public service. So the warships could be from NATO, they could be from France, the European Union, the United States, even Iran. Iran actually has a professional naval force that operates in a responsible manner. Now they also have uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps Navy in the Persian Gulf that I would say does not operate in a professional manner and sometimes very dangerously. But the Iranian Navy, when it operates uh, on the high seas, is conducting the same sort of operations that all other navies are. And U.S. vessels 
would uh, would answer the, the questions of the Iranian Navy. They don't sustain. There's not anything untoward going on there because uh, all of these vessels are involved in counter piracy operations, and the commercial ships realize this. They understand it. They welcome the patrols, just like we would welcome having police walk around in an area that's not exactly safe. We wouldn't be suspicious of them. We'd view them as as helpful. All right, finally, the right of submarine cables and pipelines is one of the high seas freedoms that applies in the exclusive economic zone with the coastal state having the right to determine where those uh, cables and pipelines actually land. So there's sort of a shared right. The coastal state has an interest in where those are, and you know certainly you wouldn't want to lay a pipeline or a cable, say, through a, a fragile coral reef something like that. So it's a shared responsibility, but both, uh, so, so both parties um, have, uh, have, uh, have rights in this regard. All right, any uh, questions up to this point? Yes. Okay. Um, according to the number five, the article 110, it says that the provision of the article applies also to the Authorities on government service. But also in the number one says that those ships are is an exception of that article, so it doesn't contradict I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't understand what article you're referring to. Article one ten right away. And article five. Oh see but it says here that uh, the ships in government service Okay. Are an exception. Okay. okay. And then in the other they are also part of the Okay. I'm not sure what you mean. Let me let's talk about it at break, okay? Okay. All right. And I'll and I'll study it and see what see what we're getting at. All right, military activities in the easy. Uh, I have a lot of examples of this just because of my um, sort of my experience. We don't we don't have to go uh, in, in all detail on these, uh, but you'll have the slides. There's about 18 states that purport to regulate military activities at the EZ. I would suggest that uh, that, that is not a lawful exercise of coastal state uh, authority. Now, some of the states uh, do so, but it's almost a historic legacy. In other words, you have 18 states that say that they can regulate military activities but not all of them, in fact, nearly all of them uh, in practice don't really care. They don't really take any steps uh, to, to do anything about it. Uh, so I have here only China, North Korea, and Peru have used force. In the case of Peru, it was uh, apparently not authorized by the national government. In the case of North Korea, um, well, they're just crazy. And in the case of China, they're just wrong on the law. Okay? Um, so those are the three that have actually used force. Uh, Peru was about 20, 25 years ago. It was one incident, and uh, they haven't done so since. Um, North Korea, as I said, is very volatile. And China is, uh, even China usually does not. It's not that every time a U.S. or a British or an Australian warship goes to the South China Sea, they get harassed by China. But they do on a, on a couple of times a year. Most of the time they don't. But a couple of times a year, there's a uh, protest and that sort of thing. Uh, Pakistan, India, and Brazil have protested uh, military surveys, but this is only occasional. And they've only done so through diplomatic demarche, which is the polite way to protest. Hey, you know, we, we saw that you did this last month. Here's a diplomatic note. We'd like you not to do that again. Uh, both Pakistan and India, I've talked to the naval forces in both countries, and they say that the reason that they have this rule is because of the other country. So for them, it's kind of a, you know, well, Pakistan is doing it, so India's got to do it, and India does it, so Pakistan has got to do it, and uh, they, they both are sort of suspicious of military activities by the other country in their exclusive economic zone. It's sort of like Turkey and, and Greece, or like the Russia and the United States during the Cold War. It's just, you know, these two countries have a thing for each other. One of the most interesting areas of military activities, though, is because it's a little more complex, are military surveys or hydrographic surveys. You see a ship like this, 
This is a U.S. Naval Service ship, USNS ship. It's not a gray ship, but it's a, it's a commissioned U.S. warship with sovereignty and status. It can conduct side scan sonar such as this, and there's been a number of incidents. This is one of them. The USNS Bowditch, which was intercepted by China in this incident in 2001, and it was uh, warned to leave the area of the South China Sea, and the vessel returned with an escort of a guided missile destroyer uh, like a day or two later, and it was uh, not harassed after that. So, so you have, you know, again, this is an example of, of China. You have examples where a coastal state, such as China, would say, well, this is really marine scientific research. I mean, let's face it. You've got the exact same equipment, side scan sonar, that somebody would use to do marine scientific research or to exploit our resources. And therefore, even though we know that this is a warship, uh, we disagree with your exercise of, of these rights. The, I think the majority view, though, and it's the U.S. view, is that surveys are mentioned specifically in the territorial sea, in straits, and harbor lake waters, but there's no mention of surveys in the exclusive economic zone. And as a military activity, it's not for resource-related purposes. In fact, the United States classifies this, marine, this data as secret. It's not available to the outside. If you look at Article 246, where it talks about the purpose of marine scientific research, the purpose of marine scientific research is to share knowledge with all mankind. It's not to collect secret data. The real reason that China doesn't like this is because it allows the United States to map the bottom of the South China Sea in order to be able to operate submarines and other, uh, and other military purposes, other devices, and that sort of thing. That's why they don't like it. So they're using this, this uh, theory that it's marine scientific research uh, as a, you know, sort of as a subterfuge to try to uh, uh, compete militarily. I'm sorry? Yes? Isn't that against the principle of good faith? Uh, on behalf of China or the United yeah. States? Uh, China, because they use the Sure. <laughs> yes. Now that's the least of their violations of good faith, I would say. Uh, this is another example in 2009 where China surrounded the USNS Impeccable, which is up there on the right, uh, with, uh, surrounded it with fishing vessels and trawlers and government vessels to try to impede a military survey. We won't go into details on these. Uh, another example is 2008, an intercept of a U.S. maritime patrol aircraft, the P-8, uh, which was approached and got within 20 feet, so it's an unsafe interception, a uh, violation of international law. This was 135 miles east of Hainan Island. Now, what this, th this, is a, this is a good case to, to sort of highlight the status of the airspace above the EEZ. Does the coastal state have any right to the airspace above the EEZ? Does anybody think it does? Yes. What? Jurisdiction. What jurisdiction? I mean, they have the right to overfly. The other side has the right to overfly the AEC. All right. So, but. so both the coastal state and other states have the exact same right to the airspace. The airspace is international airspace. So while the EEZ, the water column, the surface of the water, and the seabed is sui generis, it's a unique area. The airspace above it is not unique. It's international airspace. There's a bright line after 12 nautical miles. The only right that the coastal state has to the airspace that is preferential is the right to generate energy from wind. So if you have a, if you have a wind farm, windmills, in the easy, and they project up into the air, there is an exclusive right to use the, the, the energy of the wind in the EZ, but not to fly with the with with airplane. Yes? Uh, are there any kind of so, so, okay. So we could, actually we could give a whole, I won't, but we could give a whole hour lecture on air defense identification zone. Um, let's just say in, in, in sum, 
that any state may declare an air defense identification zone over any area. The United States could declare an air defense identification zone over Mexico. China could dare declare an air defense identification zone over the United States. It doesn't matter what the declaration is. What matters is how that state intends to use or enforce it. The devil is in the details. States may declare an air defense identification zone and require aircraft to identify themselves if that aircraft is coming into the coastal state's national airspace. If it's coming into the national airspace. If there's no intention to, come in, to enter into the national airspace, then there's no authority to require any sort of reporting. So just like I said right of approach, all warships have right of approach, all countries have right to declare an alias. It doesn't mean anybody has to comply with it. Okay? Uh, I think that the issue of military activities in the exclusive economic zone is something that you're going to see in the rear view mirror. You're not going to see it as much of an issue anymore. The reason why is because China's fleet has grown exponentially over the last 15 years. China now conducts intelligence operations off the U.S. coast of Guam and Hawaii in the U.S. exclusive economic zone. So I think that, the, that this issue is not going to be as pressing as it has been over the last 10 or 15 years or so. The main thing to remember about the rights and the, and the rights and jurisdictions of the coastal state and the rights and freedoms of other states is that both the coastal state and other states have to exercise due regard for the other country's rights. So in Article 58, states have due regard for the rights and duties of the coastal state. When the U.S. Navy operates a warship 100 miles off Hainan Island, which, by the way, we don't because that's too close. But, well, sometimes 75, I guess 75 North miles. That's about the closest that they get. Not because they legally can't, but just politically they, they don't want to stir the pot too much. But if, if a U.S. warship is within the easy of Hana Island, it has a legal duty to exercise due regard for the coastal states' rights. We know what those coastal states' rights are in Article 56. On the other hand, China, in that scenario, also has to have due regard for the rights of other states in its own EZ. And we know what those rights are. Article 87, that's imported by Article 58, Paragraph 2, freedom of navigation and overflight and other internationally lawful uses of the sea, as well as all those other rights. The right to deny piracy, exclusive flag state jurisdiction, sovereign immunity, all the rest, from 88 to Article 115, China would have to exercise due regard, not just for the United States, of course, but for any country that's operating in its EZ. And countries do that all the time. Australia, Japan, Korea, operate in the Chinese EZ. Due regard is not a substantive right. In other words, it has been argued that, that, that a country cannot conduct, say, a military activity because it doesn't have due regard for the rights of the coastal state, meaning that the term due regard is sometimes misinterpreted as respect for the coastal state. Or it doesn't have, it doesn't pay attention to the feelings of the people of China. Or the inclination to want to control the area off the shore. That's not what due regard is. Due regard is not a substantive right. Due regard is a procedural right. What it means is that you must observe the rights that are already existing. You must be sure to observe those rights that we've talked about. So both sides have due regards. What do you do in the case of, of conflict in, uh, or a disagreement over uh, some areas that are not covered by the convention in the exclusive economic zone? Suppose you get the question of which country has right to control archaeology in the exclusive economic zone? <coughs> Well, that's not really listed in any of those rights that we've talked about. Could be kind of one or the other. How do you analyze that? I can't give you the answer on archaeology, but I can give you the legal formula that you can that you can uh, craft your own analysis. You want to go to Article 59, 
which said that cons conflicts have to be resolved on the basis of equity. What is equity? Fairness. What's fairness? Who knows? <laughs> conflicts have to be resolved on the basis of fairness in light of all the relevant circumstances, taking into account the respected importance of the interests involved, taking into account the, intre the interest involved, the importance of the interest involved, to the, co to the parties, the coastal state and the other state. So now if we have a conflict, suppose we have a conflict between Canada and the United States in one of the countries easy. How do we resolve the conflict? Well, on fairness, what's fair, who knows? Then we look at all the relevant circumstances. So we line up all of the we get all of our facts straight of exactly what's going on. And then finally, we have to take into account the importance of the interests involved. The interests of the coastal state, the interests of the, the other state. So the importance of the, of, the, uh, of the issues or the interests involved of the coastal state and the other state, these two states, and their interests. And the importance to the international community as a whole. So I would argue that in this analysis, the, the other state that's operating in the coastal state EZ gets preference. It gets preference. Why is that? Because there's two things that you have to take into account. And the coastal state is only one half of one of them. So if there's two things, this is 100%. There's 50% here, and there's 50% here. In this 50%, the parties, the coastal state is 25%, and the other state is 25%. The state that wants to operate in the EEZ. You have to take into account their interests. That's 50%. Then, you have to take into account the interests of the international community as a whole. That's another 50%. So if the United States wants to operate in Canada's EZ, and there's a disagreement, I would suggest that 75% of the rights inure to the United States, which is part of the international community as a whole. In other words, the preference is for the other state and the international community to be able to do what they want to do in the EZ. And it's a much more limited right for the coastal state. Now, you don't have to accept that. I just, I just uh, dissected that as, a, as one analysis. But I think that given that earlier, uh, what we talked about, that the EEZ was cut out of the high seas, and it's a grant by the international community to the coastal states to say you can do these limited things, means that if there's, a, if there's something that sort of falls in a gray area, I think that the default is that the international community can, can do that in the coastal state EEZ. That's, just, that's, that's my uh, argument. Reasonable people could differ, but that's uh, sort of the analysis. All right, in the interest of time, I'm going to, uh, I think you're going to get fisheries. So, I think we're out of time, aren't we, Young? Uh, no, 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 no. Maybe, maybe <laughs> How much time do I have? Uh, I Am I done? No, 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 no. Five more minutes? Five more minutes? Okay. All right. <laughs> I'll, I'll talk about. Uh, so we, we really talked about the balance of rights. You're going to get a, an entire presentation on fishing, but I'll mention fishing exclusively in the EZ. In the last five minutes. The coastal state, we know, has exclusive sovereign rights and jurisdiction for fishing. There's no doubt about this. It's an ironclad exclusive right. The coastal state has the right to conservation, meaning conserving or preserving the fish stocks and the other living resources. And the only rule is that the coastal state has to maintain or restore maximum sustainable yield. The idea is that we view the oceans as a productive zone for humanity, as, a, as an agricultural zone for humanity. So the only so what the international community said was to the coastal states, we'll give you exclusive rights to this area offshore. That's fine. You can have this 200 miles, and only you can access it. But you have 
to promise that you're going to conserve the fish stocks. In other words, there's this interest that we all have sort of in the globe to, to protect and conserve the natural resources of the world under the exclusive management of the coastal state. So the only thing that the coastal state has to do is to be able to maintain or restore maximum sustainable yield, which is that yield, which is the maximum uh, uh, the, 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 the natural environment will produce. And it's qualified, though, by the need of coastal fishing communities, which is a subsistence right. It's not a national right. It's the right of these coastal communities, such as you see here in, in uh, Somalia, and the needs of developing states. So it's a qualified right, but there's a pre preference to maintain maximum sustainable yield and not go too far and exploit the resources too much. But it's qualified by this, this, uh, the, the special needs of developing states. The, uh, coastal states also have the exclusive right of utilization. And utilization is under the, the, uh, the, the entire management of the coastal state. Other states may have access to that area, but only in a very limited, uh, only in a very limited circumstance. If the coastal state has excess capacity, then under Article 62, it may, doesn't have to, but it may give foreign flag fishing vessels access to the EEZ. How do you determine if there's excess capacity? There's surplus catch, or excess capacity. This is the amount that the, that the coastal state is not using for its own purposes. And the total allowable catch is qualified maximum sustainable yield, which we just talked about in the previous slide. That's the total allowable catch to be at an equilibrium. Make sure that you're not taking too much. Minus the coastal state's capacity to harvest. So if it's a developing coastal state, they have a limited population, let's say Namibia, they say, we've got this huge EEZ, we don't really have the capacity to harvest it, we don't really need all this fish, then they would be able to, uh, to provide this surplus catch to other countries. Now, they could do so on whatever terms they want. They could do so just because they feel sorry for the other country, or they could do so based upon market principles. Yeah, you can come in our EZ, but you're going to have to pay for it. You're going to have to provide us with, uh, with some sort of uh, financial incentive. So access for foreign fishing is basically the prerogative of the coastal state. And there is, among all of these coastal states, developing states have preference and also states who have habitually fished in this area, in this exclusive economic zone, also have preference. Now, they have preference, but that, they have preference over other, other countries that want to go into that EZ. They don't have preference over the coastal state. The coastal state still controls all this process. This is the, the appropriate means by which, for example, China could request, request access to the EEZs of its neighbors. It has to go to them and request the access under Article 62. It doesn't mean that Vietnam or Malaysia or the Philippines has to say yes, but this is the, the article that was, that was designed to, uh, to address those areas in which a country has habitually or historically fished in an, in an area that is now under the EEZ of a coastal state. All right. I think um, for our time, this is a uh, Korean Coast Guard uh, on the right and Chinese fishing vessels in the Yellow Sea on the left. You can see that the Chinese vessels strap all of their ships together. They lash them all together, so it's very difficult to, uh, for the Korean Coast Guard to be able to board them. And you can see on here the uh, Korean Coast Guard there's actually a Korean Coast Guard vessel that was that was sunk recently, and there's been Korean Coast Guard uh, officials which have been injured in trying to enforce their um, exclusive economic zone in the Yellow Sea. Uh, 
And, and part of this is, I won't get into the limitation, part of this is um, that China is, is uh, you know, it has a huge population, a voracious appetite for fisheries. Uh, Chinese consume about one fourth of the world's fisheries, and so uh, conflict in that case is inevitable. Uh, that's all I have. Let's take a break. How much time do we have for a break?